Today's video is sponsored by Bosley. Grab a $250 gift card toward one of their trusted hair restoration solutions. More on that in just a bit. It's one of the most fascinating objects in the inner solar system. Between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars, in the region known as the asteroid belt, lies a fragment of a planet that didn't quite make it. Known as Ceres, it began to form over 4.5 billion years ago from swirling clouds of dust and gas, just like Mars, Venus, Mercury, or Earth. Unlike its siblings, though, Ceres never reached full size. Disrupted by Jupiter's immense gravity, it instead maxed out at a mere 13th of the radius of our world. Yet, while it may be tiny, Ceres is far from boring. Once thought to be dead and inert, we now know it's geologically active, its surface dotted with the remnants of ancient ice volcanoes. But it's below the surface that things get really interesting. Using data from NASA's Dawn mission, scientists today believe at least two reservoirs of liquid water exist under Ceres' crust. And that raises a tantalizing possibility that this dwarf planet might even harbor microbial life. Both the first object ever discovered in the asteroid belt and the only dwarf planet this side of Neptune, this is the story of Ceres, our mysterious frozen neighbor. Depending on how you look at it, the dwarf planet Ceres is either remarkably small or astoundingly big. Small because compared to most widely known solar system objects, it's barely a pebble with a diameter of just 939 kilometers. It's not even a third of the size of our moon. Tiny little Pluto has a mass 14 times greater. In short, Ceres is at best the Tinkerbell of the planetary family, a sibling so small it would make Earth appear a towering Gaston. But that's only coming from one perspective. Seen from another, Ceres' size is all sorts of impressive. Located between Mars and Jupiter, the dwarf planet is just one of about two million known objects in the asteroid belt. It's also by far the largest. If you were to gather up the entire asteroid belt into a single clump and weigh it, a full third of its mass would be entirely down to Ceres. Nothing else even comes close. The next biggest object in the asteroid belt, Vesta, is slightly over half its size and less than a third of its mass. It might be a shrimp among planets, but by asteroid standards, Ceres is like a blue whale on steroids. It's in comparisons like this that we start to broach what makes Ceres so fascinating. The way it stands between two types of worlds, neither fully one nor quite the other. Suffice to say, this has confused countless scientists over the centuries. Since its discovery, Ceres has been classified at different times as both a proper planet and a mere asteroid. Yet it's not just its awkward size that makes our closest dwarf planet so compelling. Ceres also has one of the shortest days in the entire solar system, completing a rotation around its axis once every nine hours. By contrast, its years are much longer than a year on Earth, lasting 1,682 of our days. Not that there would be any way of marking the passage of time on its cratered surface. But unlike Mars or Earth, Ceres doesn't have a tilt. This means that it doesn't experience seasons, things stay pretty much the same all year round. Since we've mentioned the cratered surface, now might be a good time to mention how odd it is. While, like our moon, Ceres is covered in craters, most of them are relatively small. The largest has a diameter of just 280 kilometers. And that's all sorts of strange, because you'd expect an inner world to be pockmarked with vast craters documenting impacts since the dawn of time. Vesta, for example, has a crater that's so big that it makes up 95% of Vesta itself. But of course, Ceres isn't just an asteroid. It's far more interesting. And that interest extends below the surface. Like the terrestrial planet, Ceres's interior is layered, and one of those layers is a mantle thought to be made of water ice. This could explain the lack of giant impact craters. By having a less dense layer beneath its crust, such as ice, Ceres's surface would theoretically be able to smooth out over time. And Ceres is thought to have a ton of ice. NASA thinks that it could make up to 25% of the dwarf planet's mass, which would mean that there is more water on Ceres than there is on Earth. There's evidence for this abundance of H2O2. Ceres' thin atmosphere seems to contain water vapor. At the bottom of its deepest craters, where the sun's rays never reach, it's thought that there might even be permanent pools of water ice. Hence why some very smart people think there's a tantalizing chance that Ceres could potentially hold the most exciting thing of all life. From the ancient dried-out riverbeds of Mars to the subsurface oceans of Europa, water in the present or the past is considered the key to finding non-terrestrial life in our solar system. And Ceres may have once had more water than most of us could possibly imagine. <laughs> 
The story of Ceres and water starts way, way back at the dawn of our solar system. Around 4 billion years ago, as the dwarf planet was forming, it's thought a load of ice became trapped in the crust. Ice that melted and trickled down through the rocks to form an ancient subsurface ocean. Nor was this melted ice the ocean's only source of water. Deep in the heart of the planet, radioactive decay was releasing heat into the dense mantle. According to a 2022 paper published in the Planetary Science Journal, this reached its peak around 3 billion years ago. At this point, the mantle was so hot that metamorphosis may have caused the rock to release billions of gallons of fluid, fluid that mostly settled into hot, briny pools deep underground. But not all of this mineral-rich water stayed put. Some of it is thought to have risen up through cracks, eventually being released into the subsurface ocean. This combination of cold sea and hot, mineral-rich jets of water could have functioned kind of like hydrothermal vents here on Earth. Hot and rich in chemicals, vents on our planet get around the need for sunlight, allowing microorganisms to thrive even in places where the sun's rays never reach. Places like, say, a lightless ocean. This is why Ceres is a good candidate for having once harbored life. Yet our closest dwarf planet's relationship with water doesn't stop there. There are also the ice volcanoes. One of Ceres' most distinctive features is the Akata Crater, a 92 kilometer wide scar created when something smashed into its crust about 20 million years ago. The heat from the impact was so intense, so long-lasting, that for a short while it turned Ceres' surface from a dusty wasteland into a rolling, churning world. At the impact site, frothing seawater was brought to the surface, a briny ocean that refroze into the strange mounds and hills around the Akata Crater. More dramatic still, was what happened underground. At the moment of impact, Ceres' crust cracked and split, creating new channels down to the remnants of the subsurface ocean, to pools of briny liquid released eons ago by ancient rock. The results? Ice volcanoes. Technically known as cryovolcanism, the ice volcanoes of Ceres would have acted like regular volcanoes on Earth, with one major difference. Instead of magma, they carried the briny liquid to the surface. A cold volcanism, the a frozen world. Combined with the heat of the asteroid impact, which took up to 5 million years to disperse, it's thought Ceres briefly had all of the ingredients for life. Whether that life actually took hold is another matter. As we said in our Europa video, Habitable does not mean inhabited, and it's entirely possible all this sloshing liquid and organic chemicals produce nothing more than an almighty mess. Either way, the ice volcanoes seem to have lasted long after the heat from the Akata impact dispersed. When NASA's Dawn probe visited Ceres in 2015, it noticed bright spots in the crater floor, now thought to be patches of hydrated sodium chloride. Hydrated the key word there, because any briny water that reaches Ceres' surface should evaporate away pretty sharpish, leaving only salt deposits. The fact that patches are still hydrated suggests an ice volcano was bringing brine to the surface as recently as just a few decades ago. And that means there must still be water under Ceres' crust. Already scientists have detected what they think might be two reservoirs lurking between 19 and 50 kilometers below the surface, the largest over 400 kilometers wide. To be sure, the water they hold isn't any water that you or I would want to go swimming in. Heavy with salt and minerals, its temperature is thought to be around minus 30 degrees Celsius, and its composition is less clear oasis and more nightmare hell swamp. Still, the possibility of liquid water anywhere in the solar system is the stuff that geek dreams are made of. It raises the prospect of a future mission one day drilling down and examining the briny water for microorganisms. But we'll talk more about the future missions in a bit. For now, we want to switch our focus to tell the other side of Ceres' story. The story of how mankind discovered our frozen neighbor in the first place. All right, we'll get back to today's video in just a second. But first, here's a word from today's video sponsor, Bosley. They're America's number one hair restoration experts. Dear viewer, you might have noticed that I am a bald man. It's been that way for a long time, actually. I lost my hair about 10 years ago. I was way way too young. <laughs> Fortunately, modern science is full of miracles, and Bosley has the latest hair restoration technology and one-day procedures, both surgical and non-surgical solutions to your hair problems. Bosley has performed more than 430,000 hair restoration procedures over 45 years of experience, so you know you're getting a proven track record that speaks for itself. So whether you're just starting your hair loss journey or you've been thinking about making a change for a while, Bosley has the solution. You can connect with them for a video consultation or head in for something a little more 
more personal at one of dozens of locations throughout the US. The sooner you take action, the more options you have. You guys can learn more about how to get a fuller, thicker head of hair by going to bosley.com forward slash geographics for a free information kit and a $250 Bosley gift card. That's bosley, B-O-S-L-E-Y dot com forward slash geographics or just click the link below and you can get a free cost estimate and find the right solution for you and now back to today's video You know the phrase that even a stopped clock is right twice a day? Well, in the 18th century, that stopped clock was the Titius Bode Law, a now discredited theory that suggested the planets orbited at predictable distances from one another. And it would indeed be right twice, starting with the discovery of the most amusingly named planet of all, Uranus. On March 13, 1781, William Herschel became the first person in human history to identify a brand new planet, accidentally sighting it while conducting a routine survey of the night sky. Because people since ancient times had assumed the solar system ended with Saturn, this was a pretty big deal for everyone. But it was an especially big deal for fans of the stopped clock that was Titius Bode. Uranus, you see, had been found at the precise point where the law suggested that it would be. And that was super, super interesting, because the formula already had a gap in it, an empty space between Mars and Jupiter where the law suggested a planet should exist. Now that Uranus had seemingly confirmed Titius Bode was right, that meant that the hunt was on for the missing planet. Leading that hunt, the Celestial Police. Despite sounding like a way more disco version of Sting's old band, the Celestial Police were, in reality, a kind of supergroup of late 18th century European astronomers. Formed by Baron Franz Xaver von Zach and Johann Hieronymus Schreiter, with additional members including Heinrich Albers and Karl Harding, the Celestial Police's stated mission was to hunt down the hidden planet. Via letters sent out to 24 astronomers across the continent, they suggested splitting the entire night sky into patches that each would monitor until the eighth planet could be found. It was one of the earliest attempts of astronomical collaboration on a grand scale, one that would make history. Well, almost. In 1800, the Celestial Police sent out their letters. Among those invited to take part was the Italian astronomer Father Giuseppe Piazzi. But before he could receive his letter, before he'd even heard of the funky new supergroup, Father Piazzi went ahead and discovered Ceres exactly where Titius Bode predicted it would be. On January 1, 1801, the Italian stood beneath the clear skies at the Palermo Astronomical Observatory in Sicily and reported sighting a strange new star. It was only after he'd carried out several more nights of observations that he realized it was moving, tracing a slower across the heavens. At first it was uncertain what this new point of light was. It didn't help that Ceres passed out of sight not long after Father Piazzi's discovery, killing any hope of independent confirmation. Luckily, the Celestial Police were able to calculate its orbit, and soon dozens of astronomers had sighted it again. By the end of the year, the unthinkable had been announced. The missing third planet predicted by Titius Bode had been found. It was the second major planetary discovery in 20 years, and it sent the scientific world nuts. Piazzi named the New World Ceres after the Roman grain goddess, who also moonlighted as Sicily's patron goddess. By the end of that year, it was accepted as an official planet. But even at this early stage, there were signs that the party wouldn't last. Although astronomers agreed it was a planet, they couldn't help but note that Ceres was remarkably small, a mere pinprick compared to Mars or Venus. Yet it wouldn't be the doubters who ended Ceres' status as one of the eight major planets but rather the enthusiasts. Because inspired by Father Piazzi's find, the Celestial Police were about to embark on a bonanza of discovery. In doing so, they would lay the grounds for Ceres to be shunted into obscurity for 150 long years. For astronomy nerds, the first decade of the 19th century was a deliriously exciting time. The reason? The Celestial Police just kept discovering new planets. Barely a year after Father Piazzi sighted Ceres, Heinrich Albers was trying to study its motion when he accidentally spotted another speck. On March the 28th, he confirmed this as another new planet, naming it Pallas. Almost exactly five years later, in March 1807, he discovered yet another new planet in the same region, naming this one Vesta. Nor was Albers the only guy making discoveries. Between Pallas and Vesta, a fellow celestial policeman, Carl Harding, and sighted another world between Mars and Jupiter, 
that he named Juno. Suddenly, from just six known planets, humanity had gone in less than 30 years to a solar system containing 11 of them. It was unbelievable. As in, literally unbelievable. As early as 1802, William Herschel, the man who'd first sniffed out Uranus, had grumpily declared the new planets were no such things. Instead, he proposed that they be known as asteroids. And while that might seem like a grumpy man's reaction to all these new planets stealing his limelight, by 1807, even the celestial police were starting to agree. When Ceres was made an official planet, it had been the smallest planet by far. But now, all these additional planets were making Ceres seem like a giant by comparison. While Ceres, as we know today, has a diameter of 939 kilometers, Vesta is barely 525 kilometers across, Pallas slightly smaller still. Juno, by contrast, has a diameter of only 247 kilometers, that's barely bigger than the length of Wales, and if space Wales could be a planet, then clearly the term had lost all meaning. Before he'd even discovered Vesta, Heinrich Olbers was starting to have his doubts. What if he wrote to a friend, rather hopefully Ceres and Pallas were fragments of a former larger planet that had been destroyed by colliding with a comet. That would mean Titius Bode still held. It would mean, too, that he and Father Piancy and Carl Harding really had discovered a planet, just one that happened to have been smashed to pieces. Sadly, time would soon prove poor Olbers wrong on both counts. After the discovery of Vesta, everything fell silent on the planet front for a while. By 1815, the Celestial Police had done what the real police did in 1986 and disbanded, and Ceres Ceres, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta were allowed to keep their dubious crowns. Father Pianzi died in 1826, convinced that he'd found a planet. But then 1845 rolled around and everything fell apart. The two killer blows wound up falling within 10 months of one another. On December 8, 1845, Astraea was discovered in the same area as Ceres. Less than half the size of Juno, it couldn't even be called Space Cornwall. Other equally small objects soon followed. But it was what happened on September the 23rd, 1846, that really killed Ceres' hopes of remaining a planet. That day, Herbe Jean-Joseph Le Verrier passed some calculations to Johann Gottfried Gall, declaring that they showed where a new planet could be found. Hours later, Gall spotted Neptune through his telescope exactly where Le Verrier said it would be. And that was a massive deal, because Neptune was so distant from Uranus that it blew the Titius Bode law to pieces. And if Titius Bode wasn't true, then a major reason to keep calling Ceres the other planet's planets had just vanished in a puff of logic. By the 1850s, the process of downgrading all objects found pre-Neptune was well underway. Pallas, Juno, Vesta, Astraea, Ceres, and a whole bunch of newly discovered objects were all reclassified as asteroids, and their region named the Asteroid Belt. As a reminder of its former importance, Father Piazzi's discovery was rechristened one series to show that even if it was just an asteroid, it had been the first. But while reclassifying a Pallas, Vesta, and space whales had been a necessary course correction, Ceres was a different matter. It would take over 140 years, but eventually humanity would come to realize that within the asteroid belt, Ceres was in a class of its own. After its unceremonial downgrade, Ceres spent decades languishing in semi-obscurity. Now it was merely a big asteroid, it just wasn't sexy enough for most people to care about. While a handful of specialists would keep a candle burning for it, it was really a pretty small candle, a tea light at best. That all changed in the 1990s. On July the 21st, 1992, the Hubble telescope snapped the world's first picture of Ceres, revealing for the first time its spherical structure. Around that same time, scientists found the first hints that this big-ass asteroid might contain something extremely exciting water ice. And this was a major find, because where water, past or present, liquid or frozen is found, NASA dollars often follow. And so it was with Ceres. In 2000, NASA opened its discovery program to pitches for lower-cost missions. Among the number was the Dawn Probe, an ambitious plan to fly to the asteroid belt and orbit both Ceres and Vesta. Made a finalist in 2001, the mission was signed off by NASA shortly after, only to be immediately cancelled. Yep. Cancelled. Mid-2003, NASA took an axe to dawn part of an era of short-sighted cost-cutting that also saw the New Horizons probe to Pluto temporarily get ditched. But Pluto at the time was still considered a planet, and that meant it was far easier to get people to pressure NASA to restart funding than it was for a mere asteroid-like Ceres. Thankfully, though, two important things were about to happen to make dawn viable again. The first was the probe's manufacturer offering to build it at cost, foregoing any profit in return for getting to do cool space 
The second was Ceres' sudden and unexpected elevation. While NASA was arguing over visiting the asteroid belt, a planet-sized revolution had been underway in the astronomy community. Over winter 2004 to spring 2005, a series of objects had been discovered out in the Kuiper belt, the distant frozen ring that orbits in the darkness beyond Neptune. The biggest objects of these, Homer, Makamake, and Eris, were close in size to Pluto. In other words, an eerie echo of what had happened decades earlier with Ceres and the asteroid belt. So, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union called a conference that has gone down in infamy. Infamy because this is the conference where delegates voted to mess up science fair solar system models everywhere by stripping Pluto of its planet status. Instead, our favorite ice ball became a dwarf planet, part of a new class that would include Eris and other large Kuiper Belt objects. But while the conference was a blow for fans of Pluto, the opposite was true for Ceres devotees. At the same time Pluto was downgraded, Ceres got a boost. That summer, it officially became the only dwarf planet in the inner solar system. And that suddenly made visiting it seem so much more important. Dawn finally launched on its record-breaking two-step mission on September 27, 2007. Arriving at Vesta in July 2011, it spent over a year in orbit around the asteroid before finally heading on for the meat of its mission. And so it was that in March of 2015, Dawn became the first probe to ever encounter a dwarf planet. If you're a big enough nerd, you probably remember the excitement of that year. Mere months after Dawn started sending back pictures of Ceres, New Horizons conducted its flyby of Pluto. But while humanity's first encounter with Pluto would dominate the headlines, what Dawn found at Ceres was equally enthralling. Over the next three years, the probe sent back images that would have been unthinkable back in 2003, at one point swooping down to a mere 35 kilometers above the surface. It was Dawn that revealed Ceres was less dense than previously thought, giving rise to the theory that Ceres might be made of porous rock, rock capable of still containing pockets of liquid water. It was Dawn, too, that detected organic molecules, the building blocks of life. And it was data from Dawn that allowed us to pinpoint the two suspected reservoirs of briny liquid just a few tantalizing kilometers below the surface. And all of this begs the question, well, what next? Sadly, there are no confirmed plans to return to our mysterious neighbor at the time of putting this video together. A proposed mission known as Calathus exists, one which would place a lander on Ceres and return 40 grams of soil to Earth for study, but it's yet to attract any funding. Beyond that, there's vague talk about one day performing orbital magnetometer observations to hopefully confirm the existence of a subsurface ocean, or even drilling down to reach an aquifer and sampling some of the cold, briny water that comes out. Any of these would be a spectacular step forward in our understanding of the solar system, steps which could potentially herald a new era in our search for life. And the fact that we're even talking about them shows some of the magic of Ceres. Not so long ago, this mysterious rocky world was thought to be just another asteroid, an inert lump turning in space with little to offer humanity. Now though, we know there is more to our neighbor than meets the eye, a hidden world of activity that, in its scope and scale, is closer to that of a planet than even Father Piazzi could have ever dreamed. Today we've only had the faintest taster of what Ceres has to offer, the briefest glimpse of this small yet fascinating world. But that's been more than enough for us to hope that someday soon we'll go back. That as the 21st century progresses, we'll learn more and more about her. This video may be over, but the story of mankind's relationship with Ceres is hopefully only just beginning. And if you enjoyed today's video, I'd really recommend that you check out another video we did about a uh, dwarf planet relevant to this video, Pluto, which I'll link to on screen now. And thank you for watching. Now, just before you leave today, maybe you're looking for something else to watch. Why not check out my new channel called Warographics? Want to know all of the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on Warographics from Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa. If it's got people fighting each other or occasionally animals, we will cover it. There is a link below.